Good evening and welcome to the Korea Society. I'm Tom Byrne, President and CEO. The Society launched a new program series at the beginning of this new year titled Women's Leadership in the U.S.-Korea Relationship. We will take a look at the rise to leadership, challenges encountered, and achievements made. Today, in our second episode of the series, I am pleased to welcome the Republic of Korea's Trade Minister, Yoo Myung-hee. I am looking forward to hearing about her 25-year career in shaping South Korea's extensive and dynamic international trade relationships. Korea is the sixth largest trading nation in the world, ahead of France and Hong Kong. Minister Yu has wide experience and many accomplishments in such a short time in her meteoric career. Briefly, she has served as a deputy minister for FTA negotiations and as director general of the Bureau of Trade Policy at the Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Energy. She has been a chief negotiator and at the forefront of key trade agreements, including the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, also known as CORUS, Korea's Free Trade Agre Agreement with China, and the Asian Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Minister Yu is also directing Korea's trade policy response to the current pandemic crisis, and she has sought to reinvigorate the role of multilateral trade frameworks. Minister Yu holds a JD from Vanderbilt University Law School here in the U.S. in Tennessee, Nashville, and was admitted to the New York State Bar in 2003. I hope she will offer to our audience something on what it takes to advance to leadership in the realm of public policy and international relations. Tonight's moderator is Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, whom we featured in our inaugural Women's Leadership Program. Ambassador Stevens is the chair of the board of the directors of the Korea Society. And she has not slowed down at all after retiring from US diplomatic service. Some highlights of her career as a diplomat were as the first American woman and the first Peace Corps volunteer in Korea to serve as a US ambassador to the Republic of Korea. As a diplomat, Kathy had key roles in his historical breakthroughs in Northern Ireland and in the Balkans. I hope you all enjoy what will be a thought provoking and inspirational conversation between two highly accomplished leaders. Thank you. Kathy, the screen is yours. Tom, thank you very much. Uh, it's really an honor to, uh, on mm -hmm. behalf of the Korea Society, to welcome uh, the Minister Yu Myung-hee to our dialogue. Uh, Minister Yu, there's uh, so many people who have been following your career and your activities and are really looking forward uh, to our conversation tonight. And I have to say, uh, I am one of them. Uh, it is really, really a pleasure to see you uh, even at a distance. Uh, I hope that we can talk very informally about, uh, about your career, about the extraordinary portfolio you have now and indeed you've had in the past and some of your thoughts about in particular US-Korean relations, but about the many, many challenges our world faces right now. But again, welcome and thank you for take, taking the time to join us. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and also invitation to share my views with Korea Society. And it's been, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure um, to work on our various Korea-US trade issues because during the process, you know, I could meet with um, many US friends and could um, enhance our bilateral relationship as well as um, mutual understanding between the two peoples. So hope that today, um, I could uh, give our viewers better idea of what I am doing as trade minister, also what I am doing for uh, strengthening Korea-US bilateral relationship. Well, thank you. Well, let's jump right in. I, and as, uh, as Tom Byrne uh, made clear in his introduction of you, you have done just about everything, I think, in terms of <laughs> trade policy, whether it's multilateral, uh, bilateral, negotiations, overseas, in Korea. But of course, now you've got the top job. And I know from my own experience in Korea how important, how key the Minister of Trade job is. But you know, I know one thing people are curious about sometimes when they uh, have a chance to uh, hear from a, a very top uh, government official is kind of what, what, is your, what are your priorities right now in terms of what do you do? We have these titles, but what would you say? And I know we're in an unusual time now, but uh, could you just tell us a little bit about your major responsibilities as Minister of Trade for, of course, a country that is one of the major trading powers and shapers uh, of the global world? 
Yes, as the name implies, trade minister is in charge of planning and implementation of trade policy. And also the minister represents the country at various international trade forums such as FTA negotiations and WTO meetings. And also I meet with various domestic stakeholders mm -hmm. to gain a better understanding of their positions and also to reflect them uh, at trade negotiations as much as possible. So for example, when I led Korea US FTA negotiations, I spent a lot of time on internal consultations with representatives from industries including agriculture, manufacturing, and services, as well as um, relevant ministries in the government. And sometimes I find these internal consultations to be much harder than my actual negotiations with the counterparts. Um, and just to give you a better picture of my day in life or my week in life as trade minister, um, let, me, let, me, let me just know, um, share this uh, in two versions, before COVID-19 and after COVID-19. Because before COVID-19, as a trade minister, I traveled a lot, having a, at least a couple of overseas trips a month, mm -hmm. meeting with my uh, fellow ministers around the world and business people from around the world to promote trade and investment bilaterally or plurilaterally, and also sometimes to resolve trade disputes and issues, and also to address um, global and uh, economic, global, global economic and trade challenges. Uh, so um, for example, back in 2019, I attended several ministerial meetings uh, with um, ISEM ministers, uh, which is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, uh, Agreement meetings uh, so with 15 ASEAN and Asian um, ministers, trade ministers. And um, you know, it was actually crunch time before finally concluding the seven year old trade negotiations among 15 countries. So we had a very frequent meeting among the ministers and I once half jokingly told them that I had lunch or dinner with my fellow ministers uh, more often than with my husband. <laughs> so that was my life before COVID-19. But after COVID-19, I attend all those meetings virtually. And our priority or topics are a little bit different because before COVID-19, we were trying to open our markets and further upgrade our rules. But right now, first, uh, we focused on ensuring the free flow of goods, services, and essential movement to people amid this pandemic crisis. And also this COVID-19 has brought about uh, some different challenges like you know, digital transformation and environment issues. So we are also discussing how to, on how to address those uh, emerging challenges uh, virtually. So I'm working at very odd hours these days. After finishing my work during um, work hours, I start to attend virtual meetings from uh, 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. Uh, when um, my kids are, are sleeping. Uh, but that is uh, my uh, um, a day in life as trade minister these days. Overall, yes, um, you know, last year, I, I, I should say that it's very challenging and rewarding because I engage with uh, various domestic um, stakeholders as well as um, trade ministers from around the world and tackle not only current challenges, current issues, but also prepare for future emerging challenges in this ever-changing world. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I guess if you don't have jet lag anymore, you have kind of webinar lag <laughs> or something, right? <laughs> yes. I can imagine because again, you, you have global responsibilities, not just a matter mm -hmm. of uh, North America or Europe uh, alone, but everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you mentioned the importance of domestic stakeholders and the, and the process that goes on at home. I, I think, uh, I know in my own diplomatic career, I had a boss a long time ago who said, you have to remember, Kathy, save your best negotiating and diplomacy for at home and for the, for the process at home, because uh, that's in many ways as important or even, and as you say, even more difficult than overseas. But I did want to follow up uh, and ask you, uh, in terms of the work you've done during the pandemic, uh, I was struck that, uh, 
shortly after the pandemic really started becoming serious, I think it was last May of, of 2020, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you negotiated a joint ministerial declaration with I think three or four other countries in Asia and, and North America trying to address some of the uh, challenges of the pandemic and to look forward even then. Um, and I'd, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more. You've told us something about what that process was like. That was probably one of the first times you had to try to negotiate in that virtual way. And, uh, and, and some of the lessons you've learned and are trying to build on now as we look hopefully to build out of this pandemic and how that's going to affect uh, uh, our future trade system. Yes. Um, as you mentioned, uh, last May, May um, 2020, Korea, together with the like-minded countries um, such as Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Chile, and Canada, we announced um, joint statement, ministerial statement, to ensure a free flow of goods, services, and essential movement of people. The reason that we came up with that idea was that when this pandemic, uh, you know, uh, happened, every country was uh, trying to raise their barriers because of this, um, um, these concerns about the um, health issue, uh, they raised their barriers and these goods and services, uh, they stopped in the middle of the way. And that also caused another problem to uh, economy and also everyday lives of uh, people. So in that regard, you know, we you know, thought it would be important, of course, uh, the safeguarding public health takes most priority. However, at the same time, we should make efforts to uphold principle of free trade and our uh, maintain our confidence in them because both of which took a lot of years, many years uh, to build. So in that regard, uh, we came up with a certain principles which could be applied in not only in the current pandemic, but also uh, perhaps in future crisis so that we could ensure free flow of goods and services. And also for some essential movement of people, we could ensure certain mechanisms so that they could actually travel amid all those uh, restrictions. And after our um, efforts, um, uh, these days, I find uh, those uh, initiatives expanding and increasing across the world. So now uh, in various trade fora, we are discussing um, how to set up a certain uh, transparent and predictable mechanism that can be applied in case of an emergency. Uh, that is uh, one thing. So this COVID-19 has posed uh, such challenges to us, how to maintain this free trade, free and smooth flow of trade in amidst of uh, this uh, pandemic or any other crisis. And this COVID-19 has posed another challenge to us, uh, basically uh, to make us reflect upon what should be done to prevent another crisis. That can be pandemic or this kind of um, health-related crisis, or that can be related to natural disaster. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, to work on the root cause of the problem, they can they can cause some uh, crisis in the future. Uh, there is a, these days, there are a lot of discussions on environment and climate change because climate change has the risk of uh, causing uh, a great, a, a, a big crisis you know, comparable to pandemic. So these days at a various trade fora, um, I and also together with my uh, fellow ministers, we are working together to find a way how trade can contribute to environment. And also this pandemic has accelerated digital transformation. So this has a, a new challenge in regard to how to govern digital world and uh, digital economy. So in that regard, trade ministers are also working together uh, to come up with a certain uh, harmonized rules in the digital area. So that's uh, some challenges that uh, we are dealing with these days. Yeah, you have outlined this enormous agenda going forward. And uh, I, I do appreciate the point uh, you've made that uh, in many ways, uh, 
this this crisis we are going through, and we've gone through with the pandemic and in public health in many ways, hopefully will prepare us for other crises like, as you say, climate change, which are really going to require a whole new level of, of international cooperation. I wanna get more into that uh, and hear your thoughts on it because I think that South Korea is going to play such an important role in all of that. But as you know, we also are interested in our conversation and if you don't mind in learning a little bit more about you and you're really uh, unique and, and, and extraordinary career as a, as a trailblazer um, uh, in, in, in your position, uh, particularly in Korea, but I would say globally. And uh, I, as, as you know, Tom Byrne outlined uh, uh, your, your extraordinary uh, uh, resume, I do know that you graduated and you correct me that from Seoul National University and studied in English, uh, I guess, and public policy, and then went on to law school uh, in the United States and, uh, and then took the New York bar. And you know our American audience thinks of the New York bar as probably the hardest exam anyone can take. And uh, but I think maybe in Korea, taking the exam to get into Seoul National University and then to get into the very very competitive civil service may be even harder. I don't know if you have any views on that. But I'm uh, I think we'd love to hear a little bit about uh, what drew you into the uh, into the trade area and uh, and how you think your background has uh, you know equipped you to to approach. The issues that you that you had to have on your plate now with, uh, with 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 the views and the skills that you have, it just it's it's really interesting. I think, especially as a as, and frankly, as the first woman to really be in almost every position. I think maybe I'm wrong that you've had as you've moved up. Uh, uh, how it, what what lessons you've drawn from that, and uh, and some observations about it, particularly the also the relationship between uh, your education in the United States and your education in, in Korea. So um, how did I end up as a trade uh, policymaker in Korea? Well, I would like to say that I had it all planned out from early on, but actually the truth is one thing led to another. So first of all, English was my first foreign language that I learned mm -hmm. when, I was, that, when I was at um, middle school. And, and also I loved literature. And, Learning a language different from your own just you know, sometimes opens your eyes. Mm -hmm. You can experience different culture and different um, society through the lens of language and literature. Mm -hmm. So that was a very um, intriguing and interesting experience to know about the world affairs through English and also uh, to know different cultures and different societies and different issues uh, through English. So when I was uh, at middle school, uh, my, uh, my dad, my father, um, when he was invited to Indian business uh, man's house uh, as a businessman and met he, uh, the family uh, members, uh, the daughters or sons of uh, that uh, businessman, um, he introduced that daughter to me so that we could exchange letters uh, together. So you no, know, it's called pamper, but they don't do that anymore because now internet is a you know, part of our daily life. So they might do uh, WhatsApp or Facebook or Instagram, whatever it is. But at that time, internet was not part of our daily lives and international travel, travel was not commonplace in Korea. So I exchanged letters with this girl in India, mm -hmm. um, talking about our um, issues as a teenager and feelings, uh, sometimes even our you know, first love or crushes as a teenager. And um, it was very fun, but also uh, very, just opens my eyes about the world and uh, makes me more curious mm -hmm. about uh, what's happening around the world. Uh, so that's why I um, majored in English and literature. And also I wanted to be a writer. I loved the literature and I wanted to be a writer when I was um, young, but of course I soon found out that um, I didn't have talent or creativity to be a writer. So mm -hmm. I gave up that dream, but I majored in English and literature. Uh, so it's, it might be a little bit odd from uh, today's perspective, but uh, so it's not just a pure coincidence that I became an international trade policymaker uh, given uh, that uh, background. And when I actually uh, worked on WTO issues and Korea-US bilateral trade issues in the government. 
I had a chance to work with uh, officials from USTR and also um, experts from the WTO Secretariat and from um, other countries. And um, some of them had a, a legal backgrounds and I found those legal backgrounds uh, to be very helpful in developing logical skills and reasonings. So that's uh, why I decided to go to US to study law um, at Vanderbilt. And in terms of uh, New York bar exam, as you said, exactly. Uh, well, in a Korean college entrance exam is much harder than New York bar exam. It's not even a question. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Korean college entrance exam, that requires a year long dedication and strong, good, good work ethic throughout the year. But New York bar exam, actually I took this exam uh, after two or three months, uh, two or three months after my daughter was born. Oh so my. while raising eight year old boy, as well as a newborn baby, I studied various uh, legal subjects for the exam. Well, uh, she's 18 years old and she in actually enjoys all those kind of debating and model MUN uh, competitions and likes to read and talk with other people. And I tell her that you know, she has developed you know, such logical, uh, logical skills and logical reasoning uh, thanks to me because I had to play Barbary tape, you know, bar exam audio tape uh, because at that time she was just not a newborn baby and I couldn't go to any uh, Barbary Institute or I couldn't have uh, in, join any study group to study for New York bar exam. So both of us are lying together or are playing together. We listen to constitutional law, contract law and civil procedures uh, to prepare for bar exam. So she studied together with me for two years as a newborn baby. And that's how I, you know, took a New York bar exam and passed the New York bar exam. And um, thanks to that, um, she enjoys uh, debate and all those kind of model MUN activities. So uh, maybe uh, she's still young, but uh, she could have some talent to be a good lawyer, thanks to me. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's so wonderful. And, and actually, it reminds me a little bit of, of, this, of the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, of course, uh, was, was going to law school and uh, trying to get through it while also raising children and uh, really made her into the great justice and uh, person she was. So it's, uh, it's, a terrific, it's a terrific story. I also like the fact that uh, pen pals were still around as you were growing up. Uh, I remember pen pals from my childhood and I actually had pen pals in Korea and I know exactly what you mean about what a deep influence they can have on being your first exposure to another culture in another country. I have to ask you, did you ever get to India? Oh. Uh Yes, I travel a lot, but at that time, you know, international travel was not commonplace. Actually, um, we were not, you know, allowed to um, travel uh, for leisure at that time when I was young, when I was in middle school and high school. So at that time, no. Uh, but you know, nowadays, as I mentioned, as trade minister, I have traveled a lot, India and all the Asian countries and also uh, US, I think I visited DC more than 10 times. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure that's right. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's fascinating that, that the world kind of opened up to you through this uh, initial initial friendship as, yeah. a, as a young girl. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn back a little bit to trade now because you've mentioned a lot of big trade issues and I would love to, to uh, dig a little deeper on some. Uh, one, of course, uh, you mentioned and you have a lot of experience with the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's, I think, a sense in the United States that uh, maybe throughout the world that uh, uh, the WTO has faced a lot of challenges in recent years uh, and, of course, uh, has failed to conclude uh, uh, its negotiations since the Doha round failed. Um, it's a big question, but uh, what do you see as the major challenges for the WTO right now and how do you see it uh, going forward? Yeah, as you mentioned, um, WTO 
has not achieved any multilateral trade agreements for the last uh, 25 years, um, except for one agreement called the Trade Facilitation Agreement. So basically, WTO has fallen behind the times. And all its three pillars are under stress. No, WTO has three core functions, negotiations, dispute settlement, and monitoring and implementation. Uh, they all need to be improved. Uh, they are all under stress right now. But especially, I would like to put particular emphasis on negotiations because WTO is supposed to uh, update its rules and uh, make additional market openings. Uh, but for the last 25 years, uh, all those multilateral negotiations have almost stalled. Um, as you mentioned, the DDA negotiations, it failed back in 2015, six years ago, but it itself was a, a efforts of 14 or you know, more than 14 years. Mm -hmm. uh, given that, you know, WTO has not evolved and kept up with changing economic realities that our businesses face in every day. So in that regard, we should revitalize the negotiating function at the WTO so that WTO can be still relevant to business people uh, in this 21st century. And, but you know, it's easier said than done. Uh, so in that regard, um, I would like to particular, uh, put, uh, particularly emphasize that uh, we need to build a, a track record of success uh, from ongoing negotiations uh, right now this year. So right now, fishery subsidy negotiation is the only multilateral negotiations going on at the WTO. Uh, basically, we are trying to discipline or prohibit uh, subsidies that can threaten uh, the uh, marine uh, resources and uh, environment. And we are aiming to conclude that negotiation by the end of this year. And uh, Korea is also making efforts with other countries. And I hope that trade ministers said we work together to conclude this negotiation by the end of this year so that we could build on these success stories to tackle harder issues. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we are right now um, having negotiations, plurilateral negotiations on e-commerce uh, and the uh, WTO and e-commerce has become more and more important, especially after COVID-19. So I hope that we could achieve uh, tangible outcomes in e-commerce negotiations. In that case, uh, that would be very meaningful to our business people. Yes, I mean, that whole area of digital technology and digital trade is clearly something that's just kind of crying out for a, a framework that it does need to be a, a global framework. Um, mm -hmm. So the WTO has a lot of work cut out in the member states to kind of get it going in a, in a positive direction uh, again. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, what we've seen over the past number of years is the, uh, the, the rise of, of, of regional uh, trade negotiations and some bilateral as well, but whether it's the, the TPP or the CPTPP, the RCEP, uh, mm -hmm. the US efforts vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europe, uh, some mm -hmm. of those have gotten further than others, of course, and we can get to, I guess, the US trade oh. in a moment. But I'd be interested in, in, in your perspective uh, from Seoul of, of the kind of interplay between those, those regional efforts uh, those mm -hmm. multilateral trading efforts and these efforts on the on the on the global level to uh, is going to shape uh, the, uh, the the trading environment. Yeah, well, in the first of all, there are so many acronyms as you mentioned, TPP, TTIP, or uh, you know, uh, and CPTPP and ICEP, and I think the best acronym is CORUS. <laughs> which is, that was very natural and good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this uh, all the bilateral and multilateral free trade agreements, um, I think they are not contradictory to the WTO, but they are complementary to the WTO. Uh, of course, the multilateral approach you know, through the WTO would be the best way to maximize our uh, benefits from trade. However, given the reality that I just mentioned before, the multilateral tra trade negotiations have stalled for the last 25 years. A lot of countries um, try to develop their own, own rules and also um, 
further open their markets uh, through this kind of a bilateral and regional uh, trade agreements. So these FTAs, regional and bilateral trade agreements could be helpful in two ways. Uh, first, no, they liberalize uh, the markets among the participants. So basically raise the level of liberalization, market liberalization among the members. And second, they fill in the gaps in the existing WTO rules. For example, e-commerce, WTO has not developed or agreed on e-commerce rules yet, mm -hmm. but it is already reflected in various FTAs and either bilateral FTAs or uh, regional prelateral FTAs. And not only e-commerce, environment and labor, those emerging issues are addressed in uh, these bilateral and regional FTAs. So it, they can fill in the gaps in the existing WTO rules. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, now we should make efforts to uh, translate these uh, benefits into multilateral context. So mm -hmm. in that regard, Korea is also working with other countries uh, to translate uh, some of the good rules into multilateral context and also uh, open our uh, markets more and more uh, in the multilateral context as well. Uh, so we will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Korea clearly has played such an important role and has really been a, a leader in forging these kind, of, these these range of free trade agreements uh, across the board, and then in engaging multilaterally. So I I expect you know, that that Korea will really play a leading role going forward. Uh, but in that context, I wonder um, what your thoughts. We have a new administration in Washington, of course, uh, President Biden, and, and actually I was I saw in the newspaper uh, that. Uh, uh, his nominee to be the new U.S. trade representative is, is uh, uh, going through the confirmation process now. A woman, by the way, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? Uh, maybe, maybe as a government official, you, you, you'll have to be. Uh, it's, it's a little awkward to ask you advice, but I mean, as you look at the Biden administration, it looks like an administration that is going to look at the multilateral side as well as some of the more bilateral trade issues. Uh, but you have such deep experience uh, uh, with with this country and with our bilateral relationship. Uh, what uh, what are your thoughts about uh, where the Biden administration might put its efforts and priorities? Well, it's, uh, it's very early uh, to say that for sure, because as you mentioned, the confirmation process of uh, the USDR nominee Catherine Tai is still underway. And also uh, recently, I've also um, I uh, read some articles uh, from the U.S. top officials uh, emphasizing domestic policy issues first amid the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Uh, so uh, they are saying that U.S. is going to uh, fo first focus on domestic issues uh, before embarking on any uh, new multilateral or new um, free trade agreements. So given that uh, it might take time for the US administration to actually um, issue its concrete directions on uh, trade policy, uh, either bilateral trade policy or multilateral trade policy. So it might be a bit early to say uh, uh, about the US trade policy for sure. But one thing clear to me and to everyone is that this Biden administration uh, attaches great priority or an emphasis on cooperation with allies. Mm -hmm. So uh, I expect them to work together with allies or you know, work together with other countries, including Korea. Mm -hmm. So uh, I look forward to working together with uh, USTR and uh, my counterparts in the US uh, to uh, discuss bilateral issues, but also uh, to discuss challenges caused by uh, the COVID-19 and challenges caused by digital transformation and uh, climate change. So I look forward to uh, working together with closely uh, with uh, uh, US counterparts. Mm -hmm. No, I think those are, if I may say, excellent insights. Uh, as you say, the, the domestic issues here loom so large. And of course, there's a kind of a, uh, a motto out there about foreign policy, including trade for the middle class. So I think there's a sensitivity yes. to, to uh, you know, getting back to your, your earlier point about domestic stakeholders. I think those loom especially large right now 
uh, at this mm -hmm. point in the United States, and it will probably take a little time. But uh, with uh, with Chorus FTA, I agree with you. That actually is a very natural uh, uh, acronym, mm -hmm. and uh, and such a well established and high high good example of uh, of trade cooperation. Uh, I think there's, there will be some opportunities for us to work together. I wonder um, if again speaking a little more broadly, if if, if you could outline, you've touched on some of it, but what you see as, as Korea's role uh, as this very trade dependent country, uh, you know, sort of buffeted by a lot of <laughs> geopolitical and economic uh, uh, headwinds uh, over the last couple of years. But maybe if you could just kind of sum up for us what you see as kind of the, the way in which Korea can try to play its role uh, for its own interests, but also in these, in these interests of the shared values and, and institutions that have uh, served us all so well. Yes, as you briefly touched upon geopolitical headwinds in the world these days, over the years, actually, the confidence in the WTO has been undermined. Um, as we see the growing protectionism and also this pandemic crisis, so the WTO and the multilateral trading system uh, really uh, are at a crossroads uh, right now, and. Uh, as you said, the Korea is the one of the largest beneficiaries from this multilateral trading system and this free trading system. Um, as such, uh, we will continue to work together with the members to uphold the principle of free trade and also uh, work together with members to further promote uh, free trade, free, fair um, trade and transparent uh, trading system in the, at the WTO. And also in that process, Korea uh, would like to share our experience in achieving economic growth uh, through trade. When I was born, Korea was a, one of the really um, um, poor countries in the world, actually, Call it a coincidence. I was born in um, 1967 when uh, Korea joined the GATT. Um, it was in 1967, yes. So um, anyway, um, and throughout my uh, lifetime, I've watched, I've witnessed Korea uh, develop its economy through trade and through multilateral trading system. So as such, we would like to uh, share our experience with other countries uh, uh, which would like to take a similar path. And second um, point that Korea would especially uh, like to make a contribution to a, a WTO system is that we could play a, a role as a bridge between uh, different groups. Now, right now at the WTO, there is an issue of a trust deficit between developing countries and developed countries, and sometimes even within developing countries and within developed countries. Mm -hmm. And Korea could understand and relate with the positions and difficulties of many other countries because we achieved our economic growth in such a short period of time. And in every stage of development, we experienced our own growing pains dealing with um, new challenges. So based on that, we could better understand other countries' sensitivities and difficulties and priorities. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to work together with the members to bridge the gap uh, between uh, different, uh, among different groups uh, at the WTO. And another uh, point that I would like to make is that Korea uh, also um, would like to contribute to new emerging issues as well um, by uh, sharing a lot of proposals. So for example, next month, um, we, would, uh, we, we will submit a proposal to the WTO to uh, discuss market opening for environmental goods and services so that trade could also make a due contribution to uh, environment protection as well as climate change. So in regard to those new emerging issues, uh, Korea would like to make uh, further contributions uh, in the coming months. Mm -hmm. That's a very ambitious and comprehensive list. And I, but I think as you describe it, that South Korea is very well positioned to do that because of its, as you say, its history and some of its past experience and some of the challenges we're facing now. It seems to me South Korea has, always, has often been a kind of early responder and adapter uh, to mm -hmm. some of these trends. And uh, I certainly welcome that. I saw it in fields like overseas development as well, where I think South Korea has really brought a lot of its experience to play other places I've served in the world. 
Um, I'd love to talk more about these issues with you, but I know that you have uh, a very busy uh, schedule always. And I, I know that our listeners would, would, would really appreciate also because the title of our series here is Women in Leadership. Uh, honestly, I always feel a little awkward about these questions. I never know what to say, but so I'm looking for you to say some really wise things. Uh, but, um, uh, but I really am very interested in your experience um, as a, uh, uh, in, in your career uh, coming up uh, in Korea. I first went to Korea as a Peace Corps volunteer, as Tom mentioned, in 1975. So I guess you were just starting primary school. So I, I, I remember Korea of that era, and I remember how fast it's changed. But I, but I also know that it was a very challenging place in, for women in many ways in terms of, of, at times, education, at times, careers, at times, balancing family. This is all, all, also true in my country. Um, mm -hmm. But I just wonder what kind of shifts that you think you, you, that you've seen in, in women's ability to uh, uh, obtain positions of influence and leadership in the wider world to, uh, has there been a shift in either the opportunities or the way that you can operate in those, uh, in those areas? Again, I say to someone who, this is, I'm being a little personal here, who you know, I never had any doubt that Korean women <laughs> were as, <laughs> as determined, as hardworking, as smart, as ambitious as all the Korean men I met, uh, but, uh, but they did have challenges and uh, I'm sure there still are challenges. And, and again, your, your, your observations on this, I think would be of great interest, certainly to me, but to all of us. Yeah, and uh, so there has been a really sea change in uh, women uh, leadership here in uh, Korea. So when I first started my career in the government, uh, I didn't have any women superiors or you know, I was usually uh, the only or the first woman in that particular ministry or department. So women was a minority and always usually junior uh, at that time. So of course, you know, my potential supervisors, they had doubts about our women and some bias or prejudice against women. So they had to think deep and hard before accepting a woman in their own department to a bureau or a division. So first, when I was assigned to WTO Affairs Division, although the minister um, approved that decision, but the director insisted on interviewing me beforehand, mm -hmm. uh, before accepting me. So it's WTO division. So I prepared for the interview, studying a lot of WTO rules and principles and issues in international trade. And his question was, the first question was, can you walk late at night? So it was not even a question. I can put an all nighter in the office. I didn't have any problem. And of course, so I, I of course answered, yes, of course, I, um, I, I could do that. And I actually um, enjoyed my work. Uh, and second question, I thought the second question would be about WTO, non-discrimination uh, policies. Uh, or uh, just the uh, MFN or national treatment, all those uh, acronyms. Uh, but second question was, can you drink in team dinner? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so and uh, I had to prove myself wherever you know, I went to prove that uh, I could work together with men. And you know, also um, I could uh, join their team building activities or dinners or drinks uh, so that we could exchange our information and uh, also build uh, some sort of network. So, uh, well, right now, a lot of things have changed since then, but there was uh, back in uh, 1994, five, uh, around that time. But since then, there has been a huge dramatic change uh, shift and uh, women leadership roles and the, not only in the Korean government or public sector, uh, but in um, private sector as well. So a uh, couple of years ago, when I accompanied my uh, president uh, to Thailand, uh, at that time, uh, my president visited uh, several ASEAN countries. And one of the fellow ministers uh, in those hosting countries, he told me that he was very impressed uh, by uh, the fact that all the accompanying ministers uh, were women. 
So the five accompanying ministers to the summit visit were all women, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Land Infrastructure and Transport, Minister of SME and Minister of Education and myself. Yeah. No male minister at all. So that is a change uh, that we have right now. But of course, uh, still uh, we have a long way to go uh, because uh, still it's not half of the uh, cabinet ministers or uh, half of the um, managerial uh, leadership positions. Uh, but right now there are a lot of junior deputy directors, uh, female deputy directors or directors in every ministry of government. So I, I believe that in a decade or maybe less than a decade, you know, women leadership, we don't even need to talk about uh, that kind of a topic in the next several years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is extraordinary, your story about, about uh, five women uh, ministers. Uh, I'm trying to think if that would have been possible in, a, in an American cabinet uh, at some point. Uh -huh. I'm not sure, that's, uh, that's quite <laughs> extraordinary, yeah. Can I, do, you, do you think that the, um, that the work culture, you said you got all these, these sort of irrelevant, you would seem to be irrelevant, but I know people care about them, like questions about work culture and would you fit in? Do you think that work culture has changed in Korea with more women uh, coming into uh, the workforce? Um, of course, yes. That, that, um, that is a good thing about an increased, uh, uh, mm -hmm. increased number of uh, women in the leadership role because uh, sometimes uh, the composition of uh, personnel itself uh, is a, a big factor in changing the culture. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Korea, um, in terms of the uh, work culture, uh, as you, you may already know, uh, we have um, certain work culture such as, you know, work hard, play hard, mm -hmm. or sometimes they say work hard, play harder. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you work a very long hours every day, but even after the long hours of work, you need to attend some team building dinners and drinks and uh, for um, certain exchange of information or networking. And sometimes the kind of uh, occasions are very useful uh, to have a very candid um, discussions on certain issues but also it makes life harder to have a balance between work and family life. Mm -hmm. But that culture itself is changing because nowadays a lot of male colleagues, they have also family duty as well. Mm -hmm. They need to go home after work to take care of their kids. Mm -hmm. So that culture is changing. And also because a lot of women are right now in either director position or director in general position, they um, attach importance on efficiency, efficient work culture as well. So in my case, I don't uh, like to work um, till late at night in the office. If I have to work, I can always work uh, from home at night uh, so that you know, I can just you know, have a quick conversation with my daughter before she goes to bed. And then after then I can still work and whatever necessary communication that I should have, I can talk uh, with my colleagues you know, via um, emails or phones, a variety of methods. So uh, rather than emphasize on that group culture that we should stay together and work together, whether we have a lot of work or not, uh, so for some sort of you know, team building, we should stay together in the office till uh, late at night. Women leaders, uh, they focus on efficiency and effectiveness of uh, the uh, working style. So in that regard, uh, the culture is changing. But something that is not changing to me is uh, still child rearing is mostly up to mothers. Right. And in Korea, mothers are expected to be more or less tiger moms. So uh, in my case, I've been uh, part-time teachers, part-time counselors and part-time coach and coordinator for extracurricular activities and um, additional studies for my kids. 
Uh, but of course, uh, no, I don't have enough energy and time to do that. So sometimes I feel pressure and, and guilt uh, uh, because I cannot spend a lot of time on that. For example, when I was traveling around last year for um, WTO Director General election, um, my daughter was applying for um, US college uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't even know when the early application deadline was because I thought it would be December 1st, mm -hmm. but uh, somehow it was November 1st or something like that. So she had to do that all alone uh, on her own. So once she complained to me that other kids are doing this uh, together with their moms uh, as a team, but uh, she had to do that uh, on her own by herself. Uh, so I felt um, really uh, pressure and some guilt at that time. Yes, uh, that is the uh, reality uh, that Korean women still face uh, in our uh, life here in Korea. And I hope that uh, they will also change it soon mm -hmm. so that uh, more male colleagues they can participate in child rearing at home. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I know it's a huge pressure on Korean women. And in fact, it's really come into the fore in the United States again, in a way with the pressures of the pandemic mm -hmm. and some of the responsibilities mm -hmm. people feel. Yeah. And I think people understand that feeling of guilt very well, although it sounds, I'm sure your, your daughter is very, very proud of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a good experience to apply for these things on your own. <laughs> With all that, um, I, it, what advice would you give? I mean, I, I'm sure you're giving your daughter some advice, but to maybe maybe young women a little older than her who already have entered the workforce or maybe are thinking about whether to go into the public sector or the private sector, you kind of alluded to both. And you know, I, I have the impression that the public sector has been a little, in a way a little more welcoming to Korean women, but I'm not sure about that. I guess there are other challenges you know, in, 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 the, in the private sector. Um, but what advice would you have of if, uh, is it possible? You've obviously done it, but, uh, you know, to combine a, a, a private life and a family life, if you choose to have a family <laughs> with uh, rising to the very top of your profession and uh, how do you, how do you manage that? You've told, given us some good hands. Um, yeah, how do I manage that? It's a lifelong struggle or homework to uh, balance between uh, family and uh, between our work. So uh, sometimes I'm doing that very well, but sometimes I myself have some regrets uh, that I should have focused more on this or that. It's a sort of a lifelong homework and lifelong task for me, but not only for me, to any woman uh, in either private sector or public sector. I think uh, right now there has been a huge increase uh, in uh, in number of women in our private sector as well, including uh, in managerial or leadership roles. And I believe they have overcome the same or similar obstacles or barriers uh, uh, as uh, the female, uh, 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 female colleagues in public sector. And uh, my advice to my daughter or to any other uh, young uh, female colleagues uh, would be to continue to learn uh, through work and sometimes, but also sometimes uh, through study and develop your own capacity and skills. And uh, that uh, lifelong uh, habit of learning will uh, lead you to more and more uh, promising opportunities and future in, uh, in, in life. So that is uh, what I would like to give um, the advice that I'd like to give to my daughter. Yeah, thank you. It is lifelong. You have to take the long mm -hmm. view. That's right. We're, mm -hmm. and, uh, yes. And I think we see that in your career and all that you've managed to do. And you're, you're still just at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. I know we're almost out of time, but I, I, I did want to say, uh, one, again, on behalf of the Korea Society, how much we appreciate your joining us. And, uh, you know, we're trying to make sure that the Korea Society stays relevant to, uh, to the U.S.-Korea relationship as it changes, as our societies change themselves. And as someone who really has deep uh, experience and ties in, in both countries, any, any suggestions you have, I mean, you've supported us in this program about how the Korea Society can try to continue to, to build those bridges 
Uh, you build bridges of trade, but build those bridges between our, our, our two peoples in this very challenging time and going forward. We'd, uh, we'd welcome it. We hope we'll have your continued participation in our, in our programs. Now, before um, uh, I offer my thoughts, I would like to thank Korea Society uh, for their tremendous contribution to strengthening Korea-US bilateral relationships and also promoting awareness and understanding of uh, both peoples. And also taking this opportunity, uh, Ambassador, I would also uh, thank, your con thank you for your contribution to enhancing our uh, relationship. Uh, and in that regard, um, I think in the Korea society is doing a wonderful job and an excellent job in connecting uh, the two countries and also promoting understanding of the two peoples. So I don't have any particular suggestions or thoughts, but uh, when I actually um, uh, heard about this interview, I could find a lot of uh, YouTube uh, uh, videos on uh, by made by Korean Korea society, so I think that's a very good way of uh, adapting to digital um, economy. So uh, there are hundreds of very useful and interesting videos on YouTube uh, on YouTube. So Korea society is already evolving. Uh, uh, together with this changing realities, changing uh, situations. So that's really good things, especially after COVID-19. Uh, I'm not sure whether we will um, resume the travel. Uh, we can have a, a frequent travels like before, but this digital economy will stay there, you know, even after COVID-19. So I think in the Korea society uh, can um, make a variety of uh, digital uh, programs so that uh, still in amid the pandemic, uh, we can exchange our views between the two sides. And second um, um, good thing about this Korea Society new activities, this program, Women in Leadership Program, uh, because you know we know a lot of uh, male leaders uh, in Korea as well as uh, in the US. Uh, but this is the episode uh, that I um, had when I was young. When I first joined the trade ministry, um, my nickname was Korea's Color Hills. Do you know Color Hills? The uh, uh, Carla Hills, of course. Oh, I was yes, she's, she's yes. a of mine, yes. Yeah, because no, she was so impressive when she visited Korea and fought for our US interest uh, a very tough, uh, in a very tough way. So before then, uh, they didn't really uh, think about uh, any, they didn't really thought about you know, women's um, role in trade. So no women at all in trade, but because her performance so impressive, uh, the male seniors, male minister and uh, vice minister, uh, they decided to recruit a female expert in trade ministry. And that's how um, I came to this trade ministry as a first deputy, female deputy director and got the nickname of Korea's Color Hills. So this kind of a program um, helps uh, just know, not only just to promote the awareness and understanding of um, each side or both uh, peoples, but also uh, that helps to spread uh, good practices uh, between the two sides and around the country. So I hope that this program, uh, this is the second episode of this program. Uh, we'll have many more um, episodes and similar series in the future. And if, uh, when, uh, whenever need be, I will also make a few contributions. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for that wrapping up that way. Uh, yeah, Korea's Carla Hills. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and Korea's Minister of Trade, Yoo Myung-hee. I really, it's been so inspiring and so fascinating to, uh, to be able to talk with you. So thank you so much for your time. We will continue this kind of engagement. We will continue to do it digitally through whatever means we have, but we also do look forward to welcoming you to, to New York uh, if you have, when you're next able to travel uh, mm -hmm. and to seeing you in Seoul and to supporting you in, in your efforts to uh, rebuild and reinvigorate 
uh, the uh, the global trading uh, system and the system of multilateral relationships that uh, have been so important to certainly Korea's success, uh, but also to the incredible relationship between our two countries. So uh, you are an inspiration, I think, to not just women in both our countries, but to all of us uh, in your public service. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for giving us so much time today. All the best. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, to uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my views uh, with you and also with the viewers. And also, um, once again, uh, thank you very much for your tremendous contribution to uh, Korea-US bilateral relationship, uh, as well as I uh, thank uh, Korea society uh, for their very uh, valuable uh, uh, contributions. And as I said before, I would like to continue to work together uh, with you and Korea society uh, to strengthen Korea-US bilateral relationship and looking forward to meeting with you in, in just not just virtually, but at a face-to-face -face in-person meeting or gala dinner hosted by Korea society, hopefully by the end of this year. Hopefully by the end of this year. Let's all work to that end. Thank you so much again, Minister. Thank you.